in, in which we get some research results from uh, various people doing fundamental science of energy in UC Davis. And our first speaker is Adam Boulay from the Department of Chemical Engineering and Material Science. He was, in fact, one of the people brought in under the Energy for the Future initiative. Uh, and I will let him introduce his own time. Is this, is this thing on? Yes. yes, sir. Cool. So Nate Lewis gave a, a fantastic introduction. And, um, definitely motivated the problem. Uh, my research is in uh, some photovoltaic devices. So this is part of part of what we would call uh, the solution. Can you use the microphone? So it doesn't work. Yeah. Hello? Does it work? Yeah. It, works. Yeah. it does. Your mouth. <laughs> Put your microphone where your mouth is. <laughs> is that better? Maybe I'll just hold it. So, like I said, I'm, I'm working on, on, on the solution. Um, so, this is what we would call the, the energy, or the efficiency scorecard for photovoltaic devices, um, published by NREL every year. Uh, I have a slightly old one. And what this basically shows is how efficient you can make the photovoltaic device. And I should just say in advance that for a single junction device, electrically, as good as you can ever get is right around 26%. Okay? And what we see over here is this is, this is single crystal and silicon, and they have a, a record efficiency of, of 25%, and that means the efficiency is really, really good. And in fact, it's never going to get better. Okay? It sort of reached that physical limit. Um, but, but, but as Nate Lewis said during his talk, the, the big problem with, with photovoltaics is that they're too expensive. It's a very, it's a very pricey form of energy to, to install. It's a very pricey uh, device to make. So all of these other technologies here, different types of photovoltaics that are being made, the, the reason that they exist isn't to make the efficiency better. It's to make the price lower. Because really, the, the important number here isn't the number of watts that you can produce in a meter, it's the, produce, it's, the, it's the number of watts you can produce per dollar. Okay? As it turns out, roofs are cheaper. Uh, the technology that I work on is this one here on the bottom. Uh, the current record efficiency is right about 7%, so it's about, it's about one fourth as good as. Uh, it's about one fourth as good as a, as a high quality silicon solar cell. Uh, but the reason that this particular technology is very interesting is because uh, you compare it with all of these other technologies, there's the possibility produ to produce them for an order of magnitude less in cost per unit. Okay, so it's a factor of 10 cheaper. Um, you can also see that over the last 20 years or so, the efficiencies have gone from about 1% and very recently up to 6 or 7%. And so this is a technology that's been developing very quickly. <coughs> so how does it work? So basically, when I'm talking about organics, I'm talking about some conjugated polymer and usually a fullerene. And they make it a donor acceptor pair. Okay? The idea is you can shine light on this donor acceptor pair. Um, typically, the, the polymer absorbs more effectively, and, and when the light is absorbed, it, it very efficiently forms an exophon excited state. This excited state uh, can be separated at the junction between donor materials and acceptor materials. Okay? So basically, if, if this exciton is close enough to this PCBM, this, this fullerene, you get a charge separation. Okay, and, and this is a very, very fast process. It happens in, in, uh, in less than 100 femtoseconds. And it's a very efficient process. It's, it, basically, if an acceptor is there, the separation will happen with 100% efficiency. Now, at this point, this, this geminate pair, as it's called, of, a, of, a, of an electron on the fullerene and a hole on the, on, the, on the P3H key is coulombically bound. Okay, in order to, in order to break that coulombic bind between them, there has to be a very strong electric field in order to break it. 
That electric field is created by the work function difference between these two electrodes. Uh, that difference is somewhere around a volt, but considering that the active layer is on the order of about 100 nanometers, then you have you know, an electric field that's millions of volts per meter. So the electric field is present, these two charges separate, free charges, and then those free charges basically hop from location to location through the device until you finally get photocurrent. Okay, that's how it works. Um, there are hundreds of people around the world that work on this and claim to have invented it. Uh, what I'm very interested in is these interfaces between material layers. Okay, we've got some mixture of donor and acceptor. We have uh, an electrode layer, and somehow those charges have to get from the donor acceptor layer to the electrode layer. And, and basically this is what I'm studying. Why do I care? So during my postdoctoral work, I did a lot of optical models of these types of uh, photovoltaic devices. And what I was able to determine is that inside of these active layers, the efficiency which with which with um, photocurrent is produced isn't even. Okay, normally you think, ah, you absorb a photon, and then regardless of where within that layer the photon is absorbed, the extraction efficiency should be the same. And as it turns out, that's not true. Uh, in these devices, near the electrode, there's a zone, sort of a dead zone, where light gets absorbed, and the probability of producing photocurrent is zero percent. So why is that? Well, it took a lot of work to sort of eke this out, but the idea is that there's a, with respect to vacuum, the work function of these materials in the active layer and in the electrode are different. Now, this is assuming that they're not touching each other. And for everybody's reference here, um, holes float in electron sink. And so a hole needs to go from this homo level within the active polymer into the electrode there's an energy barrier, and that energy barrier would basically prevent charge from moving. Now, as it turns out, this particular electrode is a very good electrode for this material, and what that means is, is that in order for there to be uh, charge flow between these, these two different layers, um, th there's a balance that's basically created by a charge transfer across the interface, which causes a vacuum level shift, and basically, that's what forms a moment contact. Okay? And normally, this dipole here, these charges are ignored. But I want to point out here that there's positive charges now on this homo level. So then if you draw a picture of how the, the electric field across the layer changes, <coughs> what that basically means is you have a very strong uh, change in electric field near the interface, and then very little change across the rest of the device. Um, some work that was done by Enro uh, basically showed that when this, this density of holes in P3HT becomes very high, it quenches excitons, and so the, the full mechanism is basically light gets absorbed in this area, and the exciton is quenched faster than it can charge separate, and that's, and that's why you don't get, that's why you have a dead zone in that part of the device. Um, so I'm very interested in seeing Basically, in studying what happens within this dead zone or, or at the interface. And as it turns out, it's a very difficult problem because it, if you want to think of it in a material sense, the question is how do you examine a buried interface? Okay, how, do you, how do you get to that interface that's two or three layers down from the device and see what's going on at that interface? Um, and so we, one of the experiments my, my group came up with was what we call a washing experiment. So we have a substrate, we can, we can put this electrode material on top of it, and we can put our polymer on top of it, and then we can, we can cure this device as if we were trying to produce a solar cell. We can, we can apply heat treatment, for example, and then we can wash the polymer back off again and see, did this interface change? So we can basically re-expose the surface and, and see if we can learn something from that. So I'll talk about this, 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 this electrode material, this P.PSS, a little bit. P.PSS is, a, is, is, a, is a, an emulsion. It's basically, the, the P. Dot here is hydrophobic, the polystyrene sulfate, the P.S.S., is hydrophilic, 
and it's deposited inside of a, an aqueous solution. And what that means is the PSS is on the outside, the P dot is on the inside. When the water is removed, all of these little uh, micelles or balls collapse down to flat little pancakes, and you get some layer that looks like this. So these sort of pancakes of PSS, with little shell, or pancakes of P dot, with little shells of PSS. If I do X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy of this particular uh, material before and after heating, we, we get a, a fairly large change in uh, these electrical, uh, in, in the, the properties that we see that are near the surface. Okay, so X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy is sensitive to about the two to three nanometers closer to the, closest to the surface. Um, and after heating, you see that there's a growth in this peak here at 289. Uh, sort of a dip forms here at 289 and a half. And there's a change in this, uh, there's a change in zero peak. And what that basically allows us to, to see is that the, the top surface after heating is covered completely with polystyrene sulfonate, and the P dot is deeper into the device. Okay? So the, poly, the, the PSS moves to the surface. If I want to do the washing experiment and see did the surface change, one very easy way to do it is to do what's called a contact angle measurement. Okay, so I wash off the polymer, put a drop of water on top of it. If the polymer is gone, then this contact angle will be very hydrophilic, it'll be a low contact angle, it's what we expect from P.PSS. If there's polymer left over on the surface, it's very hydrophobic, uh, it'll repel the water, and we'd expect that contact angle to go up. And so if I do contact angle versus heat treatment temperature, we can see that the contact angle stays very low for temperatures up to about 120. And then at higher temperatures, um, the contact angle goes up, and what that basically means is that the, um, that the polymer is sticking to the surface. At temperatures of like 180 degrees, you can get an entire layer of polymer. So then, if we, if I, if I redo the uh, the XPS measurements, I can see that the that this P3HT material, it's the green line here, has a unique peak at uh, 287. And if I look at this mixed layer, so I put the P3HT heat it and I wash it back off again, like this purple line, and that purple line has both the signature of P3HT and the PSS, and in fact I can do a fit to this particular graph and basically see it's 50% PSS and 50% P3HT, or essentially it's a mixed interface. The other thing that I know is that because this P3HT is still there, let's see it here, whoops, see it here as well, that means it didn't wash off again. It's stuck to the surface. It doesn't tell me whether it was a chemical bond sticking. It doesn't tell me whether it was a surface mixing. It just tells me it's there. So the next thing I really wanted to know is, well, is it just at the surface? Or is the P3HT, does the polymer move all the way through the electrode material? So in order to do that, we did elastic neutron scattering experiments. Um, this is uh, basically a reflectometry technique where we're looking at the contrast that's formed in, uh, at very low angles um, between the, the interference of the neutrons incident on the surface as a function of angle. Okay? Neutrons are very sensitive to hydrogens, so not heavy things like, electro, but like, a, like x-rays, but hydrogens. And we can basically then make a, a map of what is the hydrogen density as a function of thickness. Um, and this is what that map looks like right here. You can see we've got the, this, this electrode material, and then if we have nothing on top of it, you get a, you get a very flat line, okay? A very sudden change from material to air. If you put the P3HT on top and, and wash it back off again at room temperature, you get no change. If you heat it up to a significantly higher temperature, you can basically see that there's this interface where there's a mixing between the two materials, and we can tell that that mixing goes on over, over a thickness of about 5 nanometers. 
we can then do some electrical measurements of this, of this mixed interface. And basically what we see is that the work function of the electrode material changes to that of the P3HT. So this, is a, this is a change of 0.4 to 0.5 EVs. It doesn't sound like very much, but over a distance of five nanometers, this is a huge change. And then we can start looking at what, is this, what effect does this have on device characteristics, okay? So what I'm showing here is a plot of, of voltage versus current density for a photovoltaic devices. And I'm displaying two different kinds of devices here. One of them is uh, what would be considered the mixture of the, of the P3HT and the PSS on top of uh, the P3HT and the PCBL on, on top of the electrodes with a morphology that's non-ideal. Um, I can add nitrobenzene to this mixture and what it, what it does is it forces P3HT to crystallize and it gets what's a more ideal morphology. Okay? So both of these devices can go on the same substrate, they can have the same electrode, you can see they have very different uh, characteristics. For the ideal morphology, we have a very high current density, uh, a good filling factor. So filling factor in this case says that you're extracting a lot of current at a high potential. But the crossing point for voltage, or the potential at which you extract uh, current, is fairly low. For the, for the more non-ideal morphology, you can see that the, that the open circuit voltage is quite a bit higher, the filling factor is lower, and the circuit current density is lower. If I heat up these two devices, so that's basically this question we, we've had the whole time. If I heat it up, I get a mixing in the interface, what is the electrical effect of that? Well, if the morphology was good to start with, it stays good, but the potential at which you extract current goes up. If your morphology started bad, you get a good morphology, and at the same time, you still extract current at this higher potential. And what that tells us is, is that this high filling factor and the high current density comes from an improved morphology, but the extraction voltage is basically controlled by the formation of this interface layer. And again, uh, it would seem like 0.5 volts is, isn't a lot, but it makes a tremendous difference in the efficiency of the device. So, in this case, what I'm measuring is this open circuit voltage for these two different types of devices as a function of the heat treatment temperature. And basically, this bottom part of the plot is all over the place, and, and it doesn't say anything particularly useful. On the other hand, I can, I can measure something called the built-in voltage. Okay, this is basically the voltage that you get between the two electrodes. And you can see that this built-in voltage, with heat treatment temperature, steadily goes up for both device types. It's the same for both device types. It peaks at heat treatment temperatures of 180 degrees, and then it crashes out at higher heat treatment temperatures. So what's going on? So basically, we start out with this mixture of, of P.PSS, dot PSS, got my little pancakes in there. We apply heat to the, to the device, and the PSS sort of moves up to the top, creates a vertical segregation. Well, PSS is an insulator. It doesn't make a very good electrode. Now, at the same time, <coughs> What happens is, is that some of this P3HT mixes into the PSS, and basically forms a bridge over the insulating layer. That means basically only charges that go across on portions of the, of, of the whole conducting polymer are able to reach the electrode. It makes the electrode selective for holes, but not for electrons. And that's the reason the built-in voltage across the device goes up. And so really the challenge in, in creating a good electrode material isn't just putting something on there that has the right work function. I mean, you could put any metal you liked on there, but it doesn't work. And the reason it doesn't work is it's not selective. Um, this P.PSS material has been used for the last 15 years for uh, light emitting diodes and solar cells. Everybody knows it's the best, quote unquote, but nobody knows why. And the answer is basically because 
when you do this heat treatment step, you create a selective electrode. And regardless of the work function of this P3HD, you could put a different polymer on there, it wouldn't matter. Because the polymer itself is creating the bridge, and that bridge is going to have the work function of the polymer. Okay, and that, that's, that's a, a particularly powerful combination. So I've, I've already set the conclusions. I'd like to, uh, to thank my group. Um, David Huang did the neutron reflectometry and some of the modeling. Dr. Daniela LaGrange uh, made some devices and did some contact angle measurements. Um, Chris and Scott are still currently working on this project. Uh, the XPS were done by Stefan Friedrich and Simon George at uh, LLNL and LBNL, and it was all funded by Department of Energy. Thank you. Okay, we have time maybe for one or two questions. In general, why one would want to consider this type of system as opposed to other systems? Why did you choose to work on that? Why is this promising system to work on? So there are basically three reasons. One is that it's a fairly cheap material to make. You can synthesize it. Two is because it's a, a polymer that you can dissolve in a solution, if you want to apply it to a surface, you can use a coating technique like spray paint, like a squeegee. Okay, you can basically put films of this thing in a very controlled way on large surfaces quickly, and that's cheap. And third, because it's a polymer, it's flexible, which means that you could put it on something that is flexible, like aluminum foil or like PET. And so the combination of those, of those three things make this technology at least 10 times cheaper than any other photovoltaic technology. So it's not as efficient, but if it, or I should say when it gets to 10%, um, it'll make all of the other technologies obsolete. So that really addresses one of Nate's comments. Uh, I think we'd better go on. Uh, so thanks again. Our next speaker is John Yu, who is a faculty member in physics, also brought in under the energy. Thank <laughs> you.